Yeah, Community Matters. Let's meet Julia Ogilvy, actor and comedian. She's going to tell jokes for us here. Uh, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. It's the one o'clock block on, on a given Wednesday. Uh, we are celebrating a day before uh, Thanksgiving, and she is joining us for that purpose um, to talk about her career as, a, as an actor and a comedian and uh, in the performing arts for a long time with great schools and a great CV. And uh, we'll weave that into this discussion, I promise. Um, Yale, what's Yale like if you're going to be an actress? What do they teach you there that you wouldn't learn in the streets of Brooklyn, Julia? Well, I actually went to Juilliard, so I can't speak to Yale, um, although I've been on their campus and seen shows there, and it's a beautiful place. Okay, Juilliard then. Yeah, um, very intense. <laughs> uh, Robin Williams called it an insane asylum with cellos. <laughs> And I, I would kind of agree. I mean, a very supportive environment, a wonderful faculty and administration. And the fellow students there are incredible, you know, amazing human beings as well as actors. And it's such a small school because there's only 18 of us per class. So there's a less than 100 actors for all four years in this department. So it's very intense, you know, 14 hours a day, five days a week for, you know, four years and on Saturdays. So <laughs> um, it was a lot, but I was so grateful. I had a scholarship. I wouldn't have been able to go there otherwise. And um, it really, the training still has my back in ways that I couldn't have anticipated in other areas besides like classical theater, you know what I mean? Like, um, you know, in other performance uh, forms like stand up comedy and voiceover work for commercials and uh, music comedy, sketch comedy, like. I'm just so grateful I went there because yes, it prepared me to do like Shakespeare regionally or internationally or whatever, you know, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that, but it's just been surprising the training and how it stuck with me over the years. Well, you know, I, I, I saw Oklahoma the other day. Um, it was the most recent version. It's only 20 years old. The original was older. And um, it reminded me, one of my favorite plays ever in the world, um, mm -hmm. it reminded me that uh, the, the cowboys and the ranchers are not necessarily friends. Mm -hmm. And so I say to you, the actresses and the comedians are not necessarily friends. Uh, <laughs> it's on a different, different side of the world, isn't it? How can you do both? That's so interesting. Um, well, it, it, it rhymes uh, with each other, you know, in the sense that they're cousins, they're both a performance form. I think the main thing, though, is actors are used to the fourth wall and, and comedians are used to uh, having that interactive in the moment element with the audience because in stand-up, there's immediate auditory calibration of success that no one can deny. As an actor, you don't know if you're bombing or not because it's a tragedy. You're in King Lear going, Ugh! and you don't know if someone's crying in the dark house or like going to their car afterwards being like, wow, that moment he like did that. It was like, it was, it was like really good. Like you, you don't know, you know, but with comedy, you immediately know <laughs> if it's going well or not, you know? So um, being an actor helps me in standup, but also it is very different um, because it's about coming from your point of view and your truth and sharing that in a comedic way with an audience versus doing a play at people. Which is harder. I suspect that, that comedy may be harder. I would say both are very difficult in different ways. Well, okay, let's, let's, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to unpack that. I sure. mean, do you follow, for example, the Kaminsky method? Uh, is that an important uh, I, method? Yeah, actually, I've heard of it, but I actually haven't seen it. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. What oh. method? What method do you follow? I mean, the, there are great actors who do master's classes and all that, and they try to teach you their style and whatever that is. Uh, 
what kind of style rubbed off on you? What do you aspire to when you're when you're on stage or on a movie set? Sure, sure. Well, I, I was very lucky at 18 because I was born and raised in Hawaii. And then I moved to New York City at 18 to get training and to go to college. Um, and so while I was at Hunter College, I was excellent studying... school, excellent school. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was at um, I was training with Maggie Flanagan uh, at the Maggie Flanagan studio in New York City while also going to Hunter. And it was a two year intensive Meisner based training program. And that changed my life because at that age at 19, you know, you're such a sponge. And Meisner focuses on emotional truth, really listening and responding and being in the moment spontaneously with everyone on stage. And it's really inside out. It starts with the emotion and the truth of the emotion and then builds from there. And then I went to Juilliard, which is the opposite, right? <laughs> which is like, it's like, it's walking and talking, how to walk and talk in a beautiful, elegant, economical way to handle a big house with no mic. You know what I mean? And so that was very outside in. And so they were these two very contradictory approaches. But in my work and with teaching, I've uh, brought them together where like um, in uh, just it as an example, well, two things. First is like with Meisner, they say, don't play the music, play the moment. But with Juilliard, they would say, of course you play the music. That's what's on the page. Do you know, so it's that that difference. And also like in, in Othello, uh, the moment that Desdemona says to Othello, I understand your fury, but not your words. She's saying, I understand you're really upset, but I don't understand what you're saying. And so for me, it's like the fury is the emotional life, which an audience really responds to. But we also wanna understand the words people are saying so we get the story. But we need both. Like if you're crystal clear when you're speaking on stage, but not emotionally full, the audience is bored. But if you're so emotional and we can't understand what you're saying, like what's the point, right? So for me as an actor and as a teacher, it's like how to get my students and myself to, for the audience to experience the fury and get the words. So with Meisner and Juilliard, it was internal and external training that I like tried to bring together. So you're a hybrid. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, when I did radio, uh, Michael Titterton, who was then the Hawaii Public Radio director, you know, he said, you have to imagine who's listening. You have to get in that person's head. You have to see yourself through the eyes of that person. And I think that's true in, in video and in television. Well, it's true everywhere. Um, but the question is, um, you know, the person through through the eyes of which you're evaluating your own image or sound is changing. You know, there's one thing constant and it's change. So if you've been doing this for 20 years or whatever, how many, uh, I think it's more, I'm sorry. Uh, then the people out there are changing mm -hmm. and their expectations, their resonance to your emotional messages are changing. So you have to study them. Do you? Well, yes, because as actors, we have to create behavior to tell a story. So in order to do that, observing people all the time, you know, currently is imperative because you want to create truthful behavior so that the story in an exciting way can be told. So actors are always observing people, behavior, and also, as you say, being conscious of how an audience takes in a story. For instance, because of TikTok and Instagram and Facebook, our attention spans are much smaller. So for instance, when I do like a sketch comedy video, I used to do it in one take and it would be five minutes. Now I do 8 million quick cuts and make it 60 seconds. Seconds. And that's because of my awareness of how content is taken in as things evolve. Wow, that is that is pretty demanding, but also that is that is a true fact of the change in our society. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a it's a little scary because if you don't do that, mm -hmm. um, you're gonna marginalize yourself. If you don't exactly. do that, you will be boring. 
It is. It's sad. I even experience it when I'm sitting in a play, seeing a play. I couldn't, I go, oh, I can't scroll down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I can't, I'm stuck here for two hours. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, and then I catch myself. I'm like, oh, this is so depressing. <laughs> well, speaking of that, I mean, you alluded to the notion of getting to the truth. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're all, although, you know, over the past uh, few years with Trump, you know, we have maybe lost uh, or changed our relationship with truth and, and how we respond to things that we know are not true. But if I go to the theater, if I watch a movie, I'm actually, I don't know if this is your experience, but certainly is mine. I'm looking to learn. I'm, I want to know you know, for example, the movie about Spain, okay? Spanish movie is a lot of that now. I want to know about Spain. I want to know about the culture. I want to know how people engage with each other. I want to make this sort of almost subconscious comparison of life in Madrid versus life in Honolulu or wherever in the U.S. Okay, so I'm looking to be educated. I'm looking to learn. And maybe that's just my way, but I think it's really, a lot of people feel that way. So the search for truth. Is it important? Uh, how important is it in delivering some, a product, if you will, that people will want to have? It's imperative because when something's truthful, it's magnetic. When an actor is being truthful, the audience leans forward and wants to know what's going to happen next. And we, as, as humans, we can smell it we can intuitively get whether someone is like being false or being truthful and earnest in the moment and i mean there's content which you were speaking to about like wanting to really learn about a subject or a place and the truth in that regard and then i'm also speaking about performance element of truth in a performance and um it's just imperative because I think that's also how we grow in terms of uh, depth and breadth of knowledge, you know, is, is, uh, is truth. And even in something like a Marvel movie or, you know, something where actually people aren't maybe not there to learn, but there to escape and to get lost in this other world. When the actors are really truthfully alive emotionally in that moment, whether it be anger in the middle of a fight, whether it be a sad scene, what have you, when they're truthful, it's so much more dynamic, even if you're in, a, in an escapist piece. Yeah, so somehow you have to come off that way. I mean, is it a conscious effort? Well, it's not about coming off that way. It's about using your instrument to just be open to the truth of the moment. So it's you. Exactly. It's the essential it's, you. You have to live a life of truth. Yes. And I think a key uh, with stand up uh, to go there for a sec is is really writing from your vulnerable truth. The more truthful and vulnerable you are about your life and how you feel about things, the more you you connect with an audience and can grow your audience and the more dynamic you are. If you're kind of surface level and um, affectating or you know having affectation, the audience smells it, you know what I mean? And they're not as engaged. Yeah, right. It's uh, sincerity. It's a uh... It's a, there's a kind of harmony involved in that, but I, I want to I want to just give you an, an old thought that I always thought had to be true, and that is that in all of comedy, somebody said this: in all of comedy, there is tragedy. Um, mm -hmm. There is always a sad story that you want to deliver, and people laugh as a kind of Shakespearean comic relief. Mm -hmm. They laugh because it's comic relief from a tragic truth. Am I right? Yes, um, because it's cathartic. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And a lot of comedians uh, delve into their pain to mine for material. And then people connect with that, you know, and um, I just finished uh, submitting to festivals and it's been doing pretty well a short film that is about depression and the depths of depression, but it's a musical comedy. Oh, no, really? <laughs> yeah. So it's really exploring because I've had struggles. I inherited chemical depression and I'm doing great now. It's been a long journey, but I've been doing amazing. So I wrote a film about it and got it done. And it's exploring all the way down to the deep end 
of the struggle while finding light amongst the darkness. Because at the end of the day, I think why people love comedy so much is we struggle with darkness, but we want to find the light. So comedians that truthfully delve into the darkness and find comedy from it, that catharsis is so desired by everybody, especially now <laughs> during these times, you know? Yeah. Do you write your own jokes? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm reminded, I'm sure you, you had contact with this when you lived here. Uh, I guess you're living here now. Um, uh, COVID, yeah, I was doing a play in D.C. when the pandemic shut it down. I came home, thought I'd be here for two weeks, then I haven't left. Okay, well, that's a good idea. There's a lot here. I'll, I'll go into that with you. But I remember uh, Frank DeLima back in the day and Andy Bumatai. Those come to mind. And those guys got big laughs out of local audiences by making racial cultural jokes. Okay, and somewhere along the line, somebody said to both of them, you're not going to, you can't do that anymore. You've got to stop. Uh, and I could repeat some of those jokes here, except I, uh, I think it's probably smarter for me not to do that. <laughs> I... <laughs> <laughs> but I, and I thought they were hysterical and they, it was such a draw and I would crack up because why? Because Hawaii has such an interesting history and people did suffer and they worked hard to achieve, you know, a middle class life, and and there were there were troubled troubled patches along the way, and so if you make fun of that, you're given that com comedic relief. Um, so how do you feel about that? Should we, you know, should we ignore, abandon those kinds of little tragedies? that are so dear to us historically um, because it's not politically correct? That's, that's such an amazing question and ties into the idea of cancel culture and the debate about that. I think it's very generational and I respect how culture progresses and I think it's for the better, hands down. But I also uh, observe this tension between an older generation of comedians. Uh, Judy Gold, a wonderful comedian, wrote this book called Yes, I Can Say That and runs through the history of, um, you know, uh, being hindered and uh, censorship in comedy, the whole history of it. She follows the whole line, gives examples. And her whole thesis is like, no, we need to be able to laugh about dark things and even racial things because it's it's a way of um, just being able to have dialogue and to laugh at certain things. But my generation and the, the younger generation, it's much more um, sensitive and I really see both sides, but I also think we're evolving in a very positive way. But I see the tension, you know, I between the generations. Um, and it is a tricky thing. It is. It's, but I think if a marginalized uh, group um, says this is disrespectful, I think that has the validity because it's not for the majority to choose whether it's disrespectful or not. That's not their call. It's the people that it's, you know what I mean? In comedy, we call it, you don't want to punch down. You want to punch up. Right. You know what I mean? Of, in terms of uh, go after the high people. Don't go after like homeless people or something. Don't hit anybody who's down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think it's nuanced and I think it's case by case. I don't think you can make a blanket statement about, well, it's good. Cancel culture is good or bad. It's really dependent on the situation, you know? Yeah. So much, so much of um, comedy, at least in the history of comedy over the past hundred years has come from the Borst circuit, uh, mm -hmm. from, from <laughs> the Catskill mountains, from <laughs> shtick. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I, I wanted to ask you about a certain joke that a friend of mine who actually went into comedy in the Borst circuit always told and always got a reaction to and why it's funny or not, okay? Uh, this is slightly edgy, but I'm going to tell you the joke. <laughs> okay. okay. It would be a, a, a blue-haired lady at the table in the front row just below the stage. And in the middle of his shtick, she would stand up and start walking to the back of the room. 
And he would say, don't go, madam. Maybe it's only gas. Mm -hmm. Meaning, wait, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. She was heading off to the bathroom. And he would say, oh, I see, I see. And the crowd would go wild every time. He included that in every routine he ever did. Mm. And, you know, I mean, it's funny in a kind of, uh, it's, it's funny in a kind of Catskills kind of way. Yeah, it's very like, hey, everybody, how's it going? You know? yeah. <laughs> How are you doing tonight, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> exactly. And, and the people laughed because this poor lady, you know, he was making fun of her. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a, what do you call it, a schadenfreude in all of that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, um, it's that um, in, in all of humor, there is tragedy. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, in all of humor, there's the possibility of, of humor through schadenfreude. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, yeah. the misgivings, the misfortune of others. Uh, exactly, exactly. Well, I think also what might have made that joke work in the room is that he's acknowledging the truth of the moment that she is leaving. Everyone sees her leaving. So he's being responsive to the undeniable. And I think in comedy, you have to be very present in the space and acknowledge what's going on. If you lie to an audience and try to pretend it's going well when it's not, they hate you. You have to be truthful and like acknowledge like, wow, this is really not going well. And I'm really <laughs> sad right now. Like, this is my dream. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sometimes yeah. I'll just say that. I'll just be like, well, I've lived a good life. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's okay to make fun of yourself. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> So I want to I want to pick up on a conversation you and I had before we started the show, and that's and that's this. You know, we live in a time of um, the divisiveness of of uh, racial strife and hatred, if you will. We we live in a time where uh, of uncertainty, of fear. We live in a time of um, you know governmental overreach and underreach. Uh, um, we live in a time where we cannot be confident of the of the continuation of our middle class lives or the lives of our children. Um, and I have not seen, and maybe it's because Broadway had not been active for most of uh, uh, 2020. Um, it's just getting active now, really. The movies are pumping things out, but uh, they don't, none of that seems to be covering, it seems to be almost abandoning, almost ignoring the problems that we live in. And I'm kind of waiting for the arts to pick up on these huge Issues, social issues, political issues, geopolitical issues uh, that we have all swirling all around us. It's not happening. Um, and in the past, I, you know, I always felt good when a given piece of art did that. But I don't see it happening. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so two things. One is the arts haven't been able to be created for about a year. And also, in terms of audiences taking in, we want escapism right now. We don't want to investigate the truth of the pain of COVID right now because we're still in it. We want to go to... Um, you know, the Eternals, you know, the Marvel movie, we want to go, you know, we want a beach novel, we want to forget, we want to forget right now. So and I think the bit the industry is cognizant of that. And also, we're still in it. Often when you go to write something, you need perspective to look back on it and go, ah, there we are. That's the story I want to tell. So give it a year or two. We're going to have some awesome movies about COVID, but nobody wants it right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, will you be in those movies, plays, what have you? I mean, what, what has your, well, I, I, I want to use the word role. Maybe that's the wrong word, but what has your role in the arts been? What are your favorite things to do? Uh, what are your most successful roles, so to speak? And where do you see that evolving in your career going forward? I know that's a big question. We we only have a few minutes, but why don't you try try answer me? <laughs> Well, I'm a bit of an odd duck. I'm very eclectic. I, because of Juilliard, I worked regionally in classical plays, also in China, like internationally, um, but then found music comedy in LA, then sketch comedy in New York, um, then sketch characters, solo sketch characters, and then uh, more Shakespeare, like off Broadway and in DC, and then now stand up. 
So I'm a bit of a weirdo and then I've done a little bit of everything. <laughs> um, and uh, I, for me, stand up artistically is what I'm experiencing the most enthusiasm about right now. Because as a writer and performer, it's the most immediate turnaround. I experience something in my life that's either painful or I find hilarious. I immediately write it, get on stage, and get feedback. And that loop um, is really what I'm passionate about right now. And the written word getting something as tight as possible to land um, a laugh, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I see a direct benefit of laughter that, that I'm passionate about because it is a form of service. Like my, uh, my fiance's grandmother just turned 90. We went to Montana to celebrate last week and I made her laugh a lot. And I was like, this, this is what it is. Relationships bringing joy catharsis as we talked about earlier and that's what i'm the most passionate about right now artistically well that's act very altruistic actually you're driven by giving gifts to people by communicating things that will make them happy this is a, this is a good life <laughs> i i feel i feel grateful yeah well, I wanted to talk about Hawaii a little, you know, if I look at you and talk to you for 20 some odd minutes, I don't, I don't see a lot of Hawaii, um, mm -hmm. but I know, I know it's in you somewhere, and I want to, <laughs> <laughs> and I want to know how, you know, Hawaii affects you, how it feeds into that hybrid thing we talked about, um, where, where, where it imposes its cultural benefit for you, um, and uh, uh, yeah, tell me yeah. about your Hawaii-ness. Yeah, so I was born and raised here, and then I left at 18 for college, was in New York for 15 years, and just came back. So, uh, you know, I am definitely uh, from here. I realize I uh, look like I'm from Nebraska. <laughs> You know what I mean? I, I do not tan. I just freckle and burn. I wrote a whole solo play about that. <laughs> and, um, and I'm so grateful I'm from here because it gives me such a unique perspective. You know, I mean, you were speaking earlier about how Hawaii culture, like uh, we used to be more um, accepting of racial humor because there's no racial majority. It's Ohana vibe. You know what I mean? So it was more culturally acceptable than it is in other places. Um, that's because of the unique makeup racially and culturally of this patchwork quilt that is incredible and there's no other place like it on earth right yes. um and because i was a part of that growing up i have a very unique point of view also here there's racial tension understandably being howly i would get crap you know and that's completely understandable there was an illegal overthrow of the monarchy <laughs> like you know what i mean like it's <laughs> fair it's tricky because i had nothing to do with it and i can't help i was born here but it, the resentment and that is totally understandable but i have perspective and humility because as a howly person i'm in the minority so i felt like guilty and other and gross and weird and then i go to the mainland and i see so many more white people and i'm like why are you acting so white <laughs> I'm like, you're gonna get your ass kicked. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> but I really like, I value that um, point of view because a lot of white people are used to being in the majority in on in on the mainland. And that's changing, by the way. Give it another generation or so, and how many people are gonna be the minority? And it's changing in a beautiful way. Yeah, so I um, totally agree. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, but I grew up always wishing that I was something else, you know? Um, but you know, you know, when, when you bring Hawaii with you, it's like, I, I don't know if this directly relates. When, when I go to the mainland, I miss the local faces. I miss them. I oh. want there to be more. I, I scan the crowd for an Asian face. I scan the crowd for a Hawaiian face. Um, I, I want that and I don't get it. And so I'm, I'm oppressed by the lack of that when I travel on the mainland. And, and I feel that if I was a, an actor, uh, I would feel the same way. I'm looking out into that sea of faces, for example, in comedy, and where are the resonating local faces? They're not there. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, the target's different. Um, the culture points are different. 
Mm -hmm. uh, how does that affect you when you, A, you know, develop your material and B, when you're out there, you know, in the crunch, uh, in mm -hmm. the Jerry Seinfeld moment of trying to connect and make them respond to you? I'll tell you what's fascinating is I perform stand up at the Blue Note in Waikiki, and it's a mix of local audience and tourists. And so I'll notice which jokes hit more with, with local people and mainland, you know what I mean? And like, I'll do um, a joke that's uh, just, you know, more about like zip code here and Hawaiian chants and stuff like that. Just my ma um, Manapua, Malasada, like you name it, like more local kind stuff. Yeah. And yeah, it resonates more with local people and they know what I'm talking about. And then other times I have like very mainland New York -y references that wouldn't hit necessarily here. And so I think it's just like knowing who's knowing your audience, you know what I mean? And, and Hawaii is a huge part of my culture. So a lot of my material involves that. Let me talk to you about um, the future of the arts in Hawaii. And then I, I, I warn you now, I'm going to ask you about the future of the, the, the arts globally after that. Mm -hmm. But, but look, looking Thanks at Hawaii. It's a heads up. <laughs> right. It's a heads up, yeah. <laughs> I mean, where are we going here? I mean, we have a few theaters. We don't have as much performing arts as I would like to see. Um, my, my favorite one, uh, to admit to you, is the opera. Um, and I, I cry at every opera, I'll tell you right now. I'm, 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 I'm a sucker for an emotional pitch. Um, and uh, I want to know what you think about the future of this place. Uh, is it fertile ground for the development of the increase of the arts? Or is it going to go flat on us? Or are we going to watch movies and do little else? I think it's a, a fervent place in time. And I can only say that about the future by looking back. I left in 05 and I came back about, you know, uh, all these years later. So when I was here in high school and middle school, like I grew up at Diamond Head Theater and Manoa Valley Theater. And, you know, and when I come back, like, Suddenly there's a, an incredible slam poetry spoken word community. There's a wonderful improv community and alternative comedy community. The stand up community has expanded. There's more um, actor groups doing work, you know, uh, UH theater department, they've got a lot going on. And it's, it's really exciting to see. And also I'm teaching for Manoa Valley Theater right now. I'm the education coordinator and also teaching classes. And my students just have a hunger to learn and want to um, tell stories and want to learn how to do it. You know what I mean? So I think I have a lot of hope and I think it's going to keep moving forward forward in a great way. Can we send our culture to the mainland? And I'm thinking specifically of a play called Allegiance that opened on Broadway a couple of uh, years ago. It was about uh, the internment camps during the war. It was a serious play made into a movie, Ra Ra Salonga. Um, and um, it, was, it was very good. I saw it here and I saw it there. But six months later, it closed. And, um, you know, the big opening, because everybody from Hawaii went to see it <laughs> a few months later, not, not going to happen. Um, so my question to you is, uh, can, can we sell our goods on the main? Can we sell our, our history, our culture through performing arts? Uh, you know, the storyteller um, with the Hawaii story. Is that ever going to be worthwhile uh, or is that going to be buried in other material? I think we'll always have the mainland. I have found people on the mainland are super hungry for stories about Hawaii um, because it's such a mystery. You know, in New York City, they're like, you're from Hawaii. They look at me like I'm a unicorn. They know nothing about <laughs> it. You know what I mean? And an experience specific example of the hunger and curiosity that is there is I'm not allowed I'm not sure if I'm allowed to give specifics on this but there is a huge composer Broadway composer who is collaborating um with a very famous I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it, uh, a Hawaiian like one of the most famous Hawaiian um, musicians right now and they're collaborating to create a Hawaiian musical that will be workshopped and potentially could go to Broadway and I've listened to some of the music and it is mind-blowing because it has Hawaiian it's Hawaiian myths Hawaiian chants but also combined with the genre of musical theater but in a respectful way not like a five six seven 
right. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, you know, it's yeah. so beautiful. I've never heard anything like it. And it's, it's really incredible. So I don't think that so much is like selling it to the mainland people. I think there's just a curiosity for them to learn. I think, um, I can't speak to that play uh, you mentioned. I, I actually haven't seen it. And, and Broadway is just, there's so many variables at play about whether something runs or not. You know what I mean? Oh, it's a tough business. And I follow it. Uh, <laughs> brutal. <laughs> brutal. Brutal. So um, my last question or area that I would like to cover with you, Julia, is this, um, you know, Broadway was down uh, for a good part of last year. It's coming back. And how strong that recovery is, we'll see, because it, it's a function of uh, how people react to the spikes in, in COVID. Um, and um, I mean, it's, it was wonderful to see it come back, wonderful, but it's, it's different and it will be different. Mm -hmm. And so my question to you is, what is the future of Broadway and the performing arts as you see it? It's a three-part question, I'm sorry. Um, what, you know, what, uh, what's the future of Broadway and the performing arts? The second is, what is, the, what is the global future of the arts? Because we live not in a flat world anymore, but a completely interdependent world. And what happens in, um, you know, in Kiev means a lot to what happens here. All those stories are worthy stories everywhere. Um, and I wonder what you think about the, you know, the, I don't want to say conflation, but the interdependence of these stories and this art as it, as it is performed hither and yon, not only on the stage, but in movies, which seem to be more international all the time, given, you know, stay at home COVID. Um, and, and finally, the third part of my question, I love asking three part questions, but I know you can handle this. What's your role in all of that going forward? So I don't think of it internationally as interdependence. I think of it as interconnectivity. Okay. So there's this very positive thing of like, because of social media, you know, because now, you know, Zoom during the pandemic has, you know, really connected us. Um, and because of the internet, like, there's a beautiful exchange that's happening much more quickly in sort of that postmodern way of combining cultures and forms of art to create multimedia pieces. And so I think of it, that interactivity that's been accelerated is a really positive thing for the arts moving forward. In terms of New York, um, you know, it's interesting. I've been home in Hawaii for over a year and a half. And just the other day, I went to the art section of the New York Times to catch up on reviews, you know, and I really went, wow, it's the backlog of shows that closed now being produced right when, you know what I mean? Um, that had closed because of the pandemic or it was so sad. I knew actors that had been rehearsing and then opening night was about to happen and everything got shut down. Well, now those productions are being done. So right now it's kind of a, a, a time of catch up, but I think um, I imagined, and I, and I think right now we need escapism, which I think is totally fair. Um, and I would imagine as we spoke to earlier, I think down the line, we'll have really interesting plays reflecting on this time, you know? Um, and then in regards to my role in this, I think I can only contribute from the truth of my experience. So whatever, like this, this short film called Everybody's Got Something that I, that I made, it was about the truth of my experience with my years of struggle with depression, but exploring it in a comedic and musical way. As I move forward, whatever I experience in my life, I think it's my job and all I can do is truthfully share my point of view and my experience in an entertaining way. So I think that's my role in all of that. I think I got to all three. Did I get to all three? You did. You got to all three. Not everybody can do that. <laughs> Julia, Ogilvy, Julia Ogilvy can answer a three-part question. <laughs> she's an actress and she's a comedian. And I have really enjoyed this discussion. And I, I'm going to work hard and try to get her to come on the show again and again. That, thank you oh. so much, Julia. Oh, thank you. It's been such a pleasure. Aloha. Aloha.